Okay, but direction of travel is a fun one. And this is gonna get a little crazy here, but not definition crazy like I just put you through, a little different. This section here is about landings. And there was this new sentence, great little nugget, added in in the 2012 edition of the IRC. Now, you can read this on your own, but you'll probably get a headache. So let me just show it to you. If I was coming down these upper stairs to the right to this landing, I don't think my direction of travel would be to walk into the guards here, right, on this mid-height landing. So why would I measure my direction of travel 36 inches this way to find out the minimum landing that I need? That wouldn't make sense. If I was walking down these stairs, I'm going to probably have a direction of travel a little more like this, heading me down to those lower stairs. But you know, the code is smarter than this. It knows that this is not also our direction of travel. The code knows that people are going to take the quickest way down these stairs. And so it assumes that most folks will walk on the walk line, which isn't a real line. It's a line that's measured 12 inches from the turning side of a stairway like this. Again, it's the side that people are most likely to just get down these stairs and cut the corner. Now from here, that walk line path continues with a 12 inch radius around the direction of travel of this particular design. And then it extends down this again, 12 inches now from that turned side. And so with this, we talked about before, right? That we have to have the landing, the width of the stairway. So let's just say for ease of understanding this, let's say it's 36 inches, our actual stairway width, compliant based on what we already talked about. Okay, so now what we do is we carry that width and we carry it around the walk line and all the rest of that is no longer minimum required landing. This is the minimum required landing for this particular stairway design. But I lied to you actually, because this is two landings. So let's just cut it here and let's put our stairs like this. And now we can see exactly the minimum allowable landing the IRC provides for a stairway. So what do we have? We have this minimum distance that has to be walked by the user. And it's assumed that that much distance might take, you know, should take two steps and it's gonna break the rhythm of the stride and allow for different design in these stairs on each side. We talk more about that in the next session. There's one benchmark. Another is that with this minimum landing, we have this much area to rest. And resting is something we're gonna talk about in the next session as well, where there's limits to how far people can get up these stairs and we wanna have places they can rest. So we now have two benchmark requirements that we can design all kinds of landings to comply with, like this one, for example. So what happened here? Our walk line distance is now measured like this. And that walk line distance cannot be any shorter than the benchmark green line I had of that quarter circle. So we're good so far. All right, now let's erase these stairs so we can really just see the two landings. So this part of this green landing, this is part of the benchmark landing and that we don't have that anymore, that's disappeared. So our area is smaller. But as long as we've replaced it with these yellow parts of our new landing design, and we have the same area of what that quarter circle, based on what the width would be of our stairs, then we have the same area, and now we can design landings to look like this. Or we could design it to look like this. This actually looks, is actually a little different than the graphic I just showed. There's probably lots of ways we could design landings. And now you can pause the video, read this complicated paragraph or, or sentence, and realize that it is so complicated because it's restricting the least possible. Awesome. Now, if you want to make funky steps, you can also make them totally.